This week on Barbell Shrug, we have guest Robert Daniel, international sumo wrestler and former bodybuilder. We're going to tear our jeans this week. <laughs> Welcome to Barbell Shrugged. I'm Mike Bledsoe here with Doug Larson and Chris Moore. Yeah. And our guest, Robert Daniel, sumo wrestler extraordinaire, international competitor. Um, you heard that right, by first, the way. First, uh, I want to remind you guys to go to barbellshrug.com, sign up for the newsletter. Just uh, go over there on the right side of the page and put your email in. Uh, go to our fan page, like us. Go to Twitter, follow us at Barbell Shrugged. And... Da -da -da -da. Today is that all you remember? <laughs> yeah, that's, I, that's my brain is full. Uh, <laughs> also, go to check out the uh, weight gain challenge. We have that going on right now. We're three weeks into the weight gain challenge, and it is going really, really well. Stupendously well. We were really going is. to uh, we we're going to see how it went, and we were like, well, maybe we'll do another one in six months, October time frame. And we decided otherwise. What ha what we did was we put. Uh, if you go to the shop, if you go to the store on our website, you can go in there and you go to the Weight Gain Challenge. If you click on that product link, it'll take you to a product page where you can put your email in. So if you're interested in starting the Weight Gain Challenge in the future, go there, put your email in, and Doug's going to send you some information. Um, he's going to send you a video about how to gain weight, and um, and you'll be on the list. So we'll be able to notify you when we're going to do it. We're probably actually going to launch that in the next two and a half months. We already have so many people signing up. We can only take a certain amount of people at a time, so we have uh, we may be relaunching that again in, in shorter than six months, just because of how much interest we've garnered on it. Yeah, the last one sold out weeks before the the, the, the cutoff date. So, uh, if you want to be on that list, again, go to go to the uh, page Mike was just talking about. Go to the product page, put your name and your email in, because we're going to give the people on that list priority over the whole rest of our uh, newsletter list as far as sign up for this particular program just because last time it sold out uh, so quickly so get your name on that list uh, and you'll get first crack at signing up for the next round which will hopefully start here in the next two months or so if you snooze you lose <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. All right, Robert. <laughs> uh, actually, one more thing. We also, we also got Dustin Thacker's <laughs> oh, that's right. um, weightlifting seminar coming up here, like in the next two or three weeks. Um, that's going to be that's going to be a live recording of a seminar. So it's not an actual seminar. Really, we're we're doing it for the recording, and we're going to let people come and watch the recording happen. And then also with all the people that are that, with that small group of people that are going to be there watching, they'll be. You know, doing the lifts and Justin will be correcting their form and you'll more or less be a part of the product. So uh, if you don't mind being on camera and you want to have a world class uh, weightlifter come and critique your form and teach you the lifts, then May 11th and 12th, uh, starting at noon on the 11th and going to about 6 or 7 p.m. And then um, starting at 9 a.m. on the 12th and going to about 4 in the afternoon, we're going to have a two day weightlifting uh, recording. Uh, where Justin Thacker is coming down from St. Louis. Uh, episode, episode 34. Episode 34 was Justin you, Thacker's you episode. I know. It's, it's all, on your palms. Show me your here. palms. Well, they're hairy, but I don't see any <laughs> oh, numbers. Wow. <laughs> wow. You see that? Yes, yeah, so if you want to learn a little bit about Justin Thacker, we did an entire episode with him, episode 34, uh, and he will be down here at Faction and uh, to do that two-day weightlifting seminar. So that's coming up here in a couple of weeks. Uh, if you want to come attend that live event, uh, then again, go to the shop and... Uh, where, do we, where do we put that in the shop? Under the seminars? Yeah. It's under click, seminars. Click on seminars and uh, click on put the Put the Justin. seminar under the seminars. It's crazy. What? Genius. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the thunk? Justin Thacker Weight Living Seminar, if you're interested in coming to that live event. Yes. All right. Uh, Robert Daniel, you're a international sumo wrestling athlete, former bodybuilder, other martial arts, and cheerleader. That's right. <laughs> all right. You, you don't see all that. Your bases all right. Covered. Good show. I think I'm probably the only one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> 
I, I, hopefully I covered all the, the, the best points already, but if you want to take us through uh, a short, maybe a two or three minute history of your, your athletic career. Yeah, well, you know, in high school, um, actually I was playing football as a freshman, and I was walking by a teacher's, the, the lady that ran the cheerleading squad, and she said, hey, come here for a second, let me talk to you. And I said, <laughs> yeah. And she said, uh, you're never going to play football uh, in the NFL. You're probably never going to play in college. But you get a scholarship in cheerleading. I was afraid. I was my height right now at 135 pounds. I'm like, yeah, I've seen that picture of you. <laughs> right. really? But yeah, but she goes, she, she she looked down at my feet and she goes, no, you're gonna be a big man. I'm like, okay, whatever, whatever. Well, because I didn't think I was gonna be large, I got into cheerleading. Uh, you know, all men, uh, um, depending on their sexual orientation, get into cheerleading for the women. That's the bottom line. I'll say it. It's the truth. Um, <laughs> However, yeah, you're, surrounded, it. you're surrounded by the hottest chicks in school for like uh, every afternoon all year long. Right, exactly. But <laughs> very quickly, but along with the, the hotness comes, you know, the ego and the drama and all that. So you very quickly you get into the, the athletic aspect. Uh, and so I did that all through high school, college and grad school. She was right. I got scholarships, full ride to University of Kentucky. Sweet. Uh, mm-hmm. And then went to grad school, University of Hawaii and uh, for, for two years to get my graduate degree. So uh, it went well. I got and I always wanted to bodybuild. So right when I got done, I stopped cheering in 96, started uh, training for my first bodybuilding show and did my first show, a novice show in 97. And I've probably done, I don't know, from 07 to uh, 2010, I probably did about 20 shows. And then I did one this summer, just kind of coming out of retirement kind of thing. Oh, just, word. Just for kicks. Now, I'm, I'm assuming that when you did... Uh cheerleading you're probably hitting the weights pretty hard i mean you may you may have been doing bodybuilding that's not competitively correct preparation for that correct well yeah everything that i wanted to do was to get bigger i knew this when i would go to these cheerleading camps and i'd see the guys that could really put the girls in the air they were bigger stronger guys uh and so that's what i want to be (laughs) (laughs) physics being what it is but Mm -hmm. yeah they uh so i wanted to just get bigger so Mm -hmm. that's what i did uh and it's taken me 30 years but i got it to 250 pounds so you know, just kind of put it on, put it on, put it on. Um, but after I got done uh, bodybuilding, uh, started, you know, taking some interest in MMA, jiu-jitsu, that sort of thing. But I, when I lived in Hawaii, I lived in Hawaii for actually 10 years, and I would see sumo on the uh, the uh, the sporting news, you know, the 5 o'clock, 10 o'clock, whatever. Mm. And I'm like, man, these guys are really scrapping. You know, at first you think, oh, as Americans, oh, yeah. we think it's just a couple of fat guys bumping bellies. Yeah. But no, they're, wrong. they're going at it. Yeah. And so I was like, wow, this is a real deal. I'd love to do this one day. Uh, I could do this, that, that explosion, that's what I'm good at, that type of thing. And uh, I was doing um, some stuff at Memphis Judo and Jiu-Jitsu, mm-hmm. and, um, and I told Dave Ferguson, I said, hey, man, I think I'm going to enter a sumo competition. He goes, that sounds like a great idea. That sounds like it'd be <laughs> perfect for you. I don't know if that meant because MMA is not perfect for you. <laughs> You're not going to be good at anything else. <laughs> right. you, should, you should do that. At one time he told your me. Your feet are too big. He said, right. <laughs> he said, cardio-wise, it's just not your thing. What he told me we were doing, uh, I forgot what we were doing one day, but he's like, you know, if, if, if the UFC was decided, the heavyweight championship was decided by a one-minute fight, with no rounds, you'd have a shot. <laughs> after Great. a minute, you're that's pu- what that's what goes for every big guy. Man. Right. After a minute, you're a punching bag. So you get a minute into it, and you realize all the strength in the world is not going to save you from this ass kicking. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. Now, I guess I had a thought. Sumo must have a following in Hawaii because we we have a yokozuna from Hawaii, right? There's yokozuna and quite a few. I think two or three Ozeki and some other top ranked guys. And what yeah. does that mean? Uh, Yokozuna, oh, Doug, grand champ- get with it! Come no. on, Yokozuna is sounds the, like uh, someone did their research before the podcast. <laughs> That's right for, for the audience, I meant. Yokozuna, <laughs> Yokozuna is actually the grand champion, uh, and then Ozeki is the level. These are people. These are people. Yeah, okay. Yokozuna. Generally, there's only two Yokozuna at a time. Some mo- sometimes one, but uh, and then there's there's then they have like you know, Ozeki. So they have East and West divisions, mm-hmm. and you have Yokozuna, Yokozuna. That's what we have now. And then there's like three Ozeki on each side. So you're a, you're you're a badass. If you're if you're the yoga zuna, <laughs> yes. I mean, because if you watch these dudes compete, they're the the all the top guys. Like, there's one guy I remember who was like 350 pounds. Mm-hmm. I don't know his height. He may he may be six foot tall. This guy was based like the most intense offensive lineman I had ever seen, but doing sumo, like he would right. explode out from that position, that three point stance, and just take a 500 pound <laughs> dude and launch him off the platform. Yeah. It's the most mm-hmm. incredible damn thing I've ever seen in my life, and I've seen lots. Of incredible damn things. <laughs> this is up there. This is like top ten of the incredible things Christopher's ever seen in his life. Right. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the whole name of the game there. That that opening, that charge, it's called the tachi eye. 
that's 90% of the game right yeah. there. You know, it's like in bodybuilding, that first look that they get at the competitors when they first, before you do one pose, you got to understand that's 90% of the game. Same thing in sumo. You get a good tachi eye, you get him backwards, his chin up, and he back on his heel, eh, it's going to have a hard time recovering. Yeah. But, you know, when we were at Memphis Judo and Jiu-Jitsu, uh, I, they just, Dave got some guys together, Mike Ostrowski from Judo and Jeff Presley wrestling, and got some guys to show me some stuff and – I ended up, my first tournament was the national championship in 09, and I got a bronze. And I was like, whoa, I didn't know, you know, yeah. that, that was going to happen. But. That's encouraging. <laughs> right. That's incredible. <laughs> right. You know, I think I'll stick all, with all, this. All with, all with Mike's help. <laughs> that's right. From, from, from the video. Mike's, Mike's apparently oh, that's, famous that's, in the sumo that's world. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I, was, oh. I, was, I was very key in that. Did and you, that bronze medal. Did you let him that wrestle That was you? after. No, that was after that. Oh, that was oh, when I was damn. Damn, my, going, into, that was <laughs> going into my second season. Well, you know, when well, we you, did, you did better the second season, right? Well, Ob- yeah, yeah. I've, I've moved up every. Yeah. I've moved up every season since I helped you. That's yeah. right. That's right. But uh, since I allowed you to throw me around like a rag doll, <laughs> no, I just he I, ran I flung me. my body into him as hard as I could. So well, yeah, you know, basically, yeah. I didn't have I didn't have training partners, uh-huh. right? So I was, you know, whenever I could get some type of training, so I said, man, I just need somebody to run into me, just get used to taking the hit, you know, just keep keep that contact. <laughs> and Mike goes. Well, I, I play football, and, but I can run into you. And I'm like, well, how much do you weigh? You know, 180 or whatever. <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, okay. And so I don't know who was filming. It might have been Doug. I, I, I was filming. I, I was like, like I'll the, get the camera. At the time, I didn't know anybody was filming. But, you know, we start 28 inches away in sumo, mm-hmm. right? And then, uh, but he was literally three yards away from me. And so I'd say <laughs> hockey oi, which means begin. And he would, I would just take my hands up and take a half step towards him. He would run full speed and slam me. My goal was to not be moved. And he would move me an inch or two. <laughs> but we did not it. Much. But, but we did it over and over and over. And he was literally sprinting at me with his head first, <laughs> like he was going to run a wall down. And so two years, was it two years ago? Yeah, two years ago, I'm at Nationals. We're at the competitor meeting, right? And this guy, Kenna Heffernan, who's from Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And Kenna's our grand champion. And uh, Kenna goes, <laughs> Rob, and he's you know he speaks in uh, pigeon. You know he's talking to me. I, I was living in Hawaii, so mm-hmm. he's like, "Hey, bro, you know this uh video? There's a video we saw of you, of a guy, little guy running into you over and over and over." Again. <laughs> he said, "We stayed laughing and laughing and laughing. We keep playing over and over again." So I'm like, "Yeah, that's pretty funny." I was like, "That's my buddy Mike." I said, "I gotta, I'll remind him." And then, and then I'd see you, and I didn't think about it when I did. Then last year I'm in Amsterdam at the Dutch Open and the tournament finishes and there's a guy from, a guy from Poland comes up to me in broken English and basically says the same thing. <laughs> hey, isn't there a video of you with some guy running over over? It was hilarious. <laughs> are, you, so, are you more famous for this or for the show? <laughs> I might be more famous for this. So. Yeah. Maybe when people come up to you in the street, sign this, please. Run into me, please. <laughs> right. <laughs> Huge fat guys everywhere I go. They want my, they want my autograph. <laughs> I, you know, I think what they were doing was like, like oh, well, this, this couldn't possibly, you know, because they're getting to do, at the time, I couldn't do any real practice. I didn't have any, you know, I have a team. Yeah. So they're doing real practice. So this is what I could get, man. Let's have one guy run into me a hundred times. You know, that's, that's all we had. <laughs> so that's, I think, was the funny part. And the fact that we did it and put it on video, for, you know, however many times that was. <laughs> Force <laughs> equals mass times acceleration. That's what they say. True story. <laughs> That's what they say. All right. So actually, on that note, so the, the needs for sumo, the the sporting needs, you know, strength, power, speed, things mm-hmm. like that, uh, are very different than the needs for a bodybuilder. Yes. So did the training for bodybuilding before sumo contribute a lot to your success in sumo? And how is the strength training different for the two sports? Um, initially, I will say this: uh, being bigger and stronger, uh, having a bigger muscle belly, and and you know, as uh, being in exercise science, you know this: the bigger a muscle belly is. Uh, you know, the thicker it is, the bigger the cross, uh, what's it called? Cross, cross section. Area. Yeah, that too. So, so the for, cross for, section. For, for the viewers at home, you have a degree in exercise science as well. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. So, but obviously I, I don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> cross this cross sectional area, even if it's water, uh, mm-hmm. it's got bigger muscles, going to be a stronger muscle. That's the way a lot of the part of the way creatine works, right? It just makes the water bloated. I mean, the muscle bloated. So there's what's gonna be stronger. So anywho, uh, that helped initially, but as the competitors got better, I needed to, one, be more explosive. I mean, I needed the same strength, but with much more speed. That's not mm-hmm. what you don't train in bodybuilding. Correct. You, really train the, you try to be the least efficient possible in every movement so the muscle does the most work. You get explosive mm-hmm. diarrhea from the diet, but you don't get explosive <laughs> on your, your right. body. Right. Yeah, using speed and momentum in, in bodybuilding is counterproductive for tr- for breaking down the muscle and spurring muscle growth correct and yeah. so so for for a sumo wrestler to to train just like a bodybuilder would make them slow and not explosive right for a bodybuilder to train explosive like a sumo wrestler they wouldn't be able to put on as much muscle mass as quickly R- correct yeah and, and you would just be an injured 
sumo wrestler and an injured body, but if you try to do both, they're mm. so vastly different energy systems. And you know, from doing martial arts that, you know, when you're lifting weights, I can, you can control the environment. I can control how hard I go. Even when somebody's coaching me, I can still control. But if I'm sparring, whether it be sumo, jujitsu, whatever, I'm going to go as, I'm going to have to defend as hard as he's attacking or vice versa. So you have that variable and then you try to throw some bodybuilding in the beginning. Yeah. I tried to do still some, you know, that vanity stayed with me and uh, not that it's gone, but you know, <laughs> and yeah, you just end up getting injured. Mm-hmm. So actually like, on that point, the last, before I had my shoulder surgery four or five years ago now, the last like three or four times that I hurt my shoulder at MMA practice was, was after I did a ton of upper body training. It wasn't necessarily bodybuilding, but I did a high volume upper body, you know, a couple of hours before I went to practice. And then when I was right. fatigued from that, then yeah. I, 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 my shoulder was not as stable and I ended up hurting my shoulder. It happened like multiple times in a row before I learned my lesson. I bet. You know, it's that analogy of the spring. You can pull the spring from one side and it'll snap back. You can bring it from the other side, it'll snap back. But if you pull both sides together, mm-hmm. you're going to stretch the spring out. And that's what uh, generally I think happens. You know, something like that. Two different energy systems at the same time training is going to end up at, at an intense level. So I think it's going to be bad news. Analogies. <laughs> I love a good analogy. <laughs> An allegory. Springs. An allegory allegory as well yeah I, I guess i the yeah i mean pre-fatiguing before uh an event where somebody is trying to hurt you <laughs> is maybe yeah. is maybe on, on not on the high list of things i would right. do yeah i could get i could get away with that when i was younger but i can't do it anymore oh so much we could get away with when we were younger yeah. you got the show notes doug for some reason i don't have them <laughs> you have the show notes Check well, while out. these guys look at their phones what, no, what, you didn't send me the show notes. Oh, what God. The hell? What, what strikes me about... I don't about, even know what to talk about now. Every time I look at sumo training, weight training-wise, I think mm-hmm. about how similar it is to me to what I needed when I was an uh, offensive lineman. I, I agree. Like, what's, what's, what, what, what makes, like, you know, Olympic weightlifting so fascinating and unique? Well, one, it's really complicated. But two, you, you pick a weight off the ground, <laughs> uh, explosively extend the hips, and then dive bomb underneath and get driven down and, and ricochet back up. Uh, so, obviously regular squats doing that all the time it's a very specific activity what's cool about like uh, being an offensive lineman or a sumo guy is that you're going from a, a state of you know flex knees and hips and perfect stillness to unbelievable all-out explosion in the right absolutely in a blink of an eye so it's like a, right. a totally different sort of activity than like on football it's even different than what a linebacker or a running back or anybody else does because mm-hmm. offensive defensive linemen are just basically like sumo wrestlers they're, they're staring each other down uh, one side knows when they're going, one side doesn't, which makes it kind of a interesting. Is that the same in sumo, though, right? Well, uh, in uh, the pros, it is. Once they have three hands on the ground, they, they just start themselves, and the ref yells, hockey oil means begin, let's get it's on. Intense. But in amateur, the referee will wait till all four hands are on the ground, and then he says hockey oil. Uh, a lot of people will try to jump start because that's how you get the speed, right, on the yeah. next guy. You get him going back, you go forward. Uh, and they do that because there's no penalty in amateur sumo for, for, for jump starting. They'll start you over 100 times. Now, the referee might scold you, but there's no penalty. So why not go ahead and jump start? Yeah. And, and to me, it, it's, it's a lesson in just how like, people always get caught up like, what is the right and wrong list of exercise? And it's, it's kind of horseshit because like for Olympic weightlifter, if you did a lots of like wider stance box squatting, and you'd be an idiot. That would not transfer at all to Olympic weightlifting. Mm-hmm. You would catch a clean and dump it immediately <laughs> and not be able to stand up every single time from now until the end of end of time. But for sumo, standing in your sumo stance, hips far back on a box uh, with a deliberately long pause, and then having somebody externally cue you to instantly squat as fast as possible. For just one clean, crisp rep is a highly effective way to actually train in a pretty, pretty close way. Mm-hmm. So yeah. It's fascinating, fascinatingly different kind of activity. I, I agree that you know you're not the only person. I've had people say the only type of squats you need to be doing is box squats. And these are guys that aren't sumo guys. They just seen the matches on YouTube or Facebook, and they they're like, yeah, that's exactly you need to have those hips back, the feet wide, the toes out, and then come out of that hole. So, yeah, so, it, yeah, it might be inverse. Like usually, you'd probably be better off doing some box squats in the off season and working into regular squatting if you're like a if you're doing crossfit or weight or something but in sumo it might be like to get a break you do some regular squats way away from your competition then the closer you get the more you get more specific with wide stance maybe even a bit of band a deliberately low pause or a long pause you might even squat to high box if that's the if that's representative of where your hip angle is i'm not quite sure i haven't looked at the video of those guys in position but yeah it's radically different yeah and, and a bunch of awesome ways 
Yeah, I'd like, I'd like yeah. to see maybe box squat for being explosive from that pause, but then also doing maybe heavy cleans or something like that, being able to absorb a really heavy yeah. load as well because right. you have to be able to absorb the hit as well. So well, if you, you know, want to deliver explosiveness and, and be able to absorb it too. Well, yeah, like when you, you know, if you've noticed that uh, I, I did the Olympic meet at y'all's place and I do, I, my goal is I'd like to do, in, in addition to the, the sumo, if I have the breaks in the schedule, I'd like to do one Olympic. If it, everything in the perfect world, I would do, be able to do one Olympic meet a year, one powerlifting meet mm-hmm. a year, one strongman event a year, and a bodybuilding event a year, just for fun. The bodybuilding's for fun. The other ones, <laughs> the other three. I don't know if anybody's ever done that. The other, <laughs> that's hardcore, know. man. It's the Bo, <laughs> Bo Jackson of strength sports. But, that's right. <laughs> Wow, the, not a bad uh, thing to be. But the but the goal is, is those other three are nothing but cross training for sumo. The whole yeah. point of me being a better Olympic weightlifter, strongman, or powerlifter is to improve my sumo game. That's a very good point. So, yeah, you know, and the the bodybuilding is just that. Man, I get I do like uh, Jennifer, my fiance, tells me uh, I get sumo bloated. Is what she says when it's, <laughs> when it's all sumo technique practice and and no cardio. So the spirit of sumo starts taking. <laughs> That's <over>. right. <laughs> That's right. Is there honey, a- honey pasta soy sauce? You're eating Cheerios. I know, but <laughs> I'm not going to get bloated here. So I, le- I learned the other night that there's weight classes, and it's not just a heavyweight and lightweight. Right. There, there's how how many weight classes are? What, what are they? Internationally, right now, there's four. There is uh, now they do them in kilos, but since I'm, most of y'all's audience, I'm sure is American, I'll, I'll do the not necessarily English, true English system. But you, you can talk in kilos. That's fine. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. No, but you have the, <laughs> oh, so you're covering. Up <laughs> right, right. Show. There you go. Uh, you have the 187. <laughs> I think is 85 kilos. That's right. 85, 85 kilos, kilos and under is uh, one weight class. Then you have uh, 85. You have what's called under 115, which is my weight class. That's middleweight, which is people laugh because there's no way you're a middleweight. Well, middleweight in sumo is 253 pounds or, or under. So uh, you have to think some of those heavyweights are 600 pounds. Oh, my God. So, uh, and by the way, you can call them fat all you want, but they'll just jump right over you or go right through you in an instant before you yeah. even have time to react. So don't confuse being fat with slow and weak. Don't <laughs> make fun of sumo wrestlers. Yeah, definitely don't do that. Not in an enclosed area where there's no escape route. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Unless you've got the skills to, to navigate that body for five minutes until the guy gets tired, then you can choke him out or armbar him. If you can do that, maybe talk shit or something. Right. Don't do it otherwise. Y'all <laughs> see the UFC, like UFC single digits four or five, yeah. where the Savate oh, guy yeah. was fighting against the... Manny Yarborough. Oh, the, yeah? Yeah, the guy, the sumo guy? Oh, yeah, he fought against that's a sumo Emmanuel, wrestler. Emmanuel Yarbrough. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. And he kicked him in the teeth? Yes. And his teeth went flying out? Oh. Out on camera? The sumo guy got kicked in the teeth? Yeah. Yeah. Oof. Yeah, so if you're that guy, talk shit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he took a knee, and the dude just fucking kicked him right in the teeth. Ooh. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, well, yeah, I think, actually, no, I was wrong. That's another guy, but Manny was in one of the first ones. I was saying he did some pride fighting, too, but he was he's the only American's ever won world championships. Oh, yeah. Um, he's 600. He was when I was like six foot eight, isn't he? I'm he's like, six, <laughs> nine. And when I I didn't wrestle against him, he had to drop out of a tournament. The the uh, I was going to wrestle him in the open. You're going to wrestle him. Yeah. yeah. In the open division, because this I didn't finish my statement. I got detracted. But um, the, uh, the you have the heavyweights is over one fifteen. Then we have open weight, which is anybody can throw their hat in the ring. Uh, and oh. so I was actually oh, going to yeah. meet Manny in the uh the next m- match and i got a buy because he forfeit because he'd gotten injured and what had happened was he was fighting a, a lightweight uh and was going to fall on him and actually put his hand down like i mean i was watching the match and he, he crushed put, his own to, hand to keep well no just to keep well, he hyperextended his elbow yeah. but just to keep him from you know he would have killed the guy the guy was 160 pounds oh. i mean he literally would have oh my god it's like dropping a volkswagen on him so <laughs> Wow. Yeah, and he's a nice guy. He's just he just stands up and moves forward and if you can't get around him, you're not pushing him back. You know, yeah. He's down. Yeah. Jeez. I, no way. I can step in with a guy that's Oh, like come on. Mike, now, now wouldn't you pounds. wouldn't you roll the dice a little bit and wrestle getting there and, and tussle with I'm, the guy? I I am scared now in the moment. You have the international Here, I'm I'm scared sitting in this room, but in the moment I might just do it. Remember yeah. during your wrestling match when that guy was probably like 350 and he was on top of oh. you, you were like pushing into a big wet blanket? <laughs> <laughs> like you couldn't get yeah. off? Well, I was, that dude was, I was twice as big. I was pre-fatigued. I was only, only. I mean, for me, getting skinny is, means I'm 250 or 245. <laughs> it means I'm, I'm compromised. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, this guy got on top of me and it was just, he had to be, he was at least 350. I mean, he was a big dude. Yeah, he was tall too. And I just remember like, it was just like having... The Stay Puff Marshmallow Man right in my face. <laughs> you push and nothing happens. And I would like put all my force into it, and my hand just wouldn't meet bone. <laughs> I couldn't exert force to move his mass. 
I ended up choking that bitch. I would have had if I knew what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. You remember? You were all there too. That was a not your novice thing. I think we have a video yeah. somewhere. It was my only foray did. into competitive uh, fighting. Right. It, it was fun as hell, but I'd never been so exhausted in my life. And afterwards, I'm laying in the floor of the Honor Classic. It's uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, auditorium or whatever the fuck. And Doug's like, "All right, we'll take a little break and we'll put, put your gi on. You can do it again in the gi division." I'm like, no. <laughs> no. I think I'm quitting here, Doug. <laughs> no, I can't. I think I'm done. <laughs> you are mistaken. <laughs> Because then, because now I'm pre fatigued, and if I wear that gi, I'm basically, you know, giving a guy a weapon to use against me. So I'm like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing with this. <laughs> right. Nationals is June 22nd. June 22nd in Kansas City, Missouri this okay. year. So yeah. if you are in the Kansas City area, mm-hmm. June 22nd, you should go check it out. Right. Independence, Missouri, actually, which is a suburb, of course. Okay. Yeah. And we were, yeah. we were talking, we were at the bar on Saturday, Sunday. A lot of talking happens at the bar. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of talking <laughs> happens at the bar. And, uh, you said, hey, they have an 85 kilo weight class. Huh. And Doug and I were both like, we're what? 85 kilos. <laughs> right? We've both been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've been drinking beer since one o'clock in the afternoon. It's like, let's make some decision, good Shit, decisions. Good decisions. Yeah, I'll sumo <laughs> wrestle. <laughs> so, but you said that anyone can attend and anyone can register for this thing. You, yeah, you don't have to qualify. Uh, you know, sumo is still small enough in the U.S. where, you know, people can jump in. And I see guys show up to the national championships like I did when they've never ever competed. Like I've never seen him at another tournament. And I go to a lot of the tournaments and they just show up and, and some of them do really well. You know, some of them do well. Like my first one, I got a bronze and you have that happen every once in a while. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, you just throw your hat in the ring and train for it. You know, so. I, I am actually not sure if my schedule's open that weekend. Oh, shut up. You're always backing out. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. But, you you know, what, I'm, what I'm saying I've is. I've got a wedding to go to, Robert. I can't, I got to be at the thing. <laughs> if, if uh, I, I feel like there's something that weekend, I know there's something a week, something the weekend after, but if that weekend's open, I plan on doing oh, sumo for the first time. Well, when I get uh, <laughs> when I get back from my honeymoon here on May 10th, well, I get married this Saturday, by the way. Uh, congratulations. congratulations. Th- thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, get back from the honeymoon on May 10th, you know, it'll go into tournament mode, which is three practices a week, you know, that type of thing. And, you know, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'm the guy that's there three times a week. The other teammates once or twi- twice a week yeah. as their schedule permits. Are there other guys in Memphis that are doing sumo right now? Yeah, yeah. But quite, guys, you know, uh, Jason Lacroix. I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. uh, Courtney Smith. Uh, oh yeah, who is oh, really? is is excellent. And oh really? If you don't, if I bet you don't, he's really good. Yeah, he is. He's smart and he's athletic. It's a dangerous combination. Yeah. If you don't beat Courtney, and I hope he hears this, if if you don't <laughs> beat Courtney off the line, you're probably going to lose. Because if he gets a hold of the belt, he's going to judo throw. He's been doing a lot of judo training. He's good at that. Um, so yeah. what I do when I fight him, I make a start by holding the belt and what he's better at. So I have to just kind of, uh, well, yeah. But one, I got, I got two questions. Mm-hmm. One, when you can, if Mike shows up at this competition, does he have to wear the little thing? The, oh yeah. The, What's the, up the, with that? The, the, here's, the that's a great question. Actually. Uh, here's the, the international rules say, uh, if I'm not mistaken <laughs> that you have to wear shorts underneath your Mawashi. Now you have to, you have to. Hmm. However, I have never been to a tournament yet where they required you to have them underneath there. I've always worn them. Uh, this, the Dutch Open, uh, in, on the registration form, it says uh, shorts are not allowed to be worn under the Mawashi. Well, so I show up, put on my Mawashi, and without pants underneath it. So it's the first time. And, you know, I train at Memphis Judo and Jiu-Jitsu. There's women and children there. I'm not going to wear that thing without shorts. That's what Dave's only request when I first started training. Sumo. <laughs> Just don't wear it without the... Have your the, bait yeah. and tackle poking out the side <laughs> exactly, of that thing. <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, so I show up to this thing, and, I, and so I'm, I'm getting ready. I look over, and the Egyptians all have their dang shorts on. And I'm like, what? Well, Damn, Egyptians. Well, every it's, time. It's because <laughs> every time they sumo wrestle, That's right. they wear those fucking shorts. Well, they're very, they're very, yeah, they're very, very good. By the way, there's a there's a pro. Uh, By the way, if you, ask me, if you ask me that, I would bet there's no way in hell that anybody in Egypt sumo wrestles. They, I would just laugh at your face. There's a guy there right now in the pro sumo in Japan. It's the first African, and being from Egypt, first African ever to be in pro sumo. Uh, and he's doing really well. I want to say he's in the Jiro division, which is just like... One to two divisions below the very, very top division, and he's just kicking butt. That's fantastic. And he's, he's pretty impressive. But anyway, but they had it on, and it was, you know, religious reasons. They're Muslim. They didn't want, you know, you don't do that. And I'm like, well, I'm Catholic. <laughs> 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 I'm, there's something written somewhere, right? I'm not, no, but, you know, you don't have to. And actually, in Japan, I've heard that they're letting kids do, and that's, it doesn't get any more traditional than that as a culture right, and right. for that sport. That's their NFL and NBA combined. And that's how those guys are looked at and that lifestyle. Um, but they're letting some kids now in Japan 
wear the shorts because the kids don't want to do sumo because they don't want their butt. Well, I was going to say, is right. it is there a problem with uh, the the culture shifting, the art form dying, and 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 kids being interested in it? Is it declining? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. In Japan, yeah, in absolutely, Japan. absolutely. Because that, that culture is radically shifting, right? I mean, yes, the old way is whatever. Have you wanted to find that? I think have been washed away a little bit, right? Uh, figuratively yeah. speaking, not like tsunami. Right. <laughs> speaking, don't get me twisted. Oh, I was gonna say. No, I was gonna say. I think. I think the looking back and respecting the history of it has been sort of given way to like everywhere else, pop culture from Correct. other parts, including our godforsaken nation. Sometimes it's right. spilled over and distracted them from what makes them unique. Right. Well, you know, and a, a lot of that I've read that they blame it on uh, the Japanese blame it on video games and baseball. The kids are either playing baseball. Damn or baseball. baseball. Yeah. Fuck, you, <laughs> fuck you, baseball. They're gonna, they should outlaw that. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, the top things uh, from bodybuilding that has helped Robert be more athletic. Hey, right, guys, Mike Bletzer here with Technique Quad. We're going to go over pressing. All right. So, uh, actually, when teaching people how to do the overhead press, I like to start from behind the neck. The reason being is, is if you start behind the neck, you're more likely to get in the overhead position that you're supposed to be in even when you press from the front. So you're, you're going to end up in the same spot overhead. It's just much more natural and easier to get there if you're pressing from the rear. So what I do if I'm pressing from behind the neck, I'm going to get the same width grip on the bar as when I press in front. I'm going to place the bar on my shoulders as if I'm doing a high bar back squat. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to press from here. One of the things I'm going to think about doing is bringing my elbows underneath the bar and I'm reaching and pressing all the way overhead. All right. So if you're here and your elbows are cocked back and you can't get them underneath the bar, that's going to be a problem for you. That, that's going to be a lot of people lack the range of motion in their shoulders to get here, in which case you won't be able to do this. And at the end of this video, I'm going to show you some, a variation of the press that's going to help you out. All right. So if you've mastered the behind the neck press, we can then do the press uh, from in front. What you're going to do is you're going to step in underneath the bar. You're going to start with your elbows slightly in front of the bar here. Stand out. Take a step back. All right, when you're standing here like this for the, the entirety of the press, you want to make sure that you are, this is really important, maintaining core stability, all right? All too often I'm watching people press, and as they press, they're back. They're going into very deep lumbar extension here. And what's happening is, is they're not getting enough range of motion here at the shoulder, so they're compensating at the back, which can cause some back pain, as you can imagine. So if you're one of those people that have to hyperextend here in order to get an overhead position, you probably want to do some stuff to work on that shoulder mobility. Um, you can check out Maximum Mobility. Doug does a good job of telling you how to find those restrictions and fix them there. <clears throat> now, uh, for the press, when you get overhead, want to make sure that you maintain that core stability. You don't want to be hyperextended here. So a good way to think about this is to make sure that your abs are tight. So if I were to come across, come to you and karate tap you in the belly, you'd hurt my hand, right? So you want to be like that. So bring it out, elbows in front of the bar slightly. You're going to press this up. The elbows are going to drop right underneath the bar. You're going to press it overhead. As you're going to press straight up and down. What you do, don't want to do is go around your head. So you're going to move your head back. And as soon as your head gets, the bar gets past your head, stick your head back underneath and finish. All right? One thing I want you to think about as you're pressing this bar <clears throat> that's going to help you get more weight is squeeze the bar. All right? You're going to engage more of your musculature and you're going to be able to move more weight if you're squeezing the bar as you put it up. I also like to think about pulling the bar apart a little bit as I'm pressing up. That allows me to engage more of my shoulders and really get that bar up there. All right, uh, one more, one more uh, barbell press, <laughs> barbell press uh, variation. What we're gonna do is, we're gonna get this bar in the rear. We're gonna do a snatch grip press. So I'm gonna grip this bar the same as I would a snatch. Again, we're gonna do the same thing. I wanna bring my elbows close to underneath the bar. I don't wanna start the press from back here. I'm gonna start the bar here, and I'm going to press overhead. So when I'm here, I'm going to bring my elbows underneath. I'm going to think about spreading the bar and pressing that bar up from here, okay? Again, if you find that you can't bring your elbows underneath that bar, more than likely you have a shoulder restriction 
and uh, you need to try and fix that again. Uh, you can check out Max Mobility to fix that. If you are having shoulder issues and you aren't able to produce, uh, do these presses without putting your back or your shoulders in a compromised position, you can use something like kettlebells to do your presses. I like to start with the thumbs touching your collarbones and the, and the kettlebell sitting here in the crux of that elbow there. So you're nice and tall here. So the same rules apply, nice stable core and a press overhead. So right here my head gets to stay neutral the whole time. I don't have to move it around at all. I'm going to keep everything nice and tight. And here, when I talk about keeping the core tight, I'm also talking about keeping the glutes squeezed. So I'm going to be nice and tight here. Now get a close up of those glutes. There you go. All right. Have fun trying out those presses. You don't? And we're back. Shocking. <laughs> Doug, Chris, myself, and our guest, Robert Daniel, sumo wrestler. Welcome back. And uh, since, since you had such an uh, awesome uh, bodybuilding background, we were going to ask you the uh, top three reasons before we left, top three reasons uh, what we can learn from bodybuilding. And uh, basically, any suggestions you have to new lifters uh, for putting on muscle mass. Yeah. Right. So, what are those top three things? Uh, was well, now <laughs> right, exactly <laughs> chop chop. Is, uh, is bodybuilding probably a plate uh, applies to CrossFit? Um, the top things you can learn is one: you don't need to move a weight like a bodybuilder moves weight. And I've mentioned this before, but bodybuilders try to be as inefficient as possible. Your joints, your tendons, your ligaments don't want to do any work. Your muscle bellies, the middle part of your muscle, wants to do all the work. So you need to do the most inefficient. Uh, movement possible like a bodybuilding squat is vastly different than a powerlifting squat uh, or anything or a front squat that you would do for Olympic lifting anything like that so, so what are those differences well well one you uh, generally the speed is the first thing you're gonna slow the heck down uh, and two you're gonna make your levers longer it whether it be your body your arms or your legs whatever's happening the the levers are gonna be you know longer. you're gonna make it harder on purpose correct correct mm -hmm. preacher yeah. girls that's that's right. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, that's that's a good example. That or, or yeah. touching the bar really high on your chest when you bench press. I guess that's another way that's of doing beat, it. That's beat stretching lane. everything as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the more inefficient you can be, the, the easier it is to work the muscle. Correct. We're not training yeah. the movement like we are on CrossFit. We're working the muscle, which is different. Right. Which is also, uh, are bodybuilders strong? Yeah. I don't know any pro bodybuilders that can't bench four hundred five for reps with these. They cannot do that. I mean, yeah, they and, all boom, 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 boom. And uh, in some cases, uh, Stan Efferding is the is a pro IFBB right card ho holding bodybuilder who also is a current Masters all time mm -hmm. raw powerlifting champion. The guy squats nine hundred and belt and he wraps and he benches benches right at six and he deadlifts like eight fifty, eight forty, eight thirty. Mm -hmm. So it's not like they're not mutually exclusive. So that's a, a good point. Like you don't. The only thing I would add to that is, like, yeah, you can train inefficiently like that to make it harder to gain muscle mass. And from that perspective, not a good thing for CrossFit. But on the other hand, you can do things in a slightly different way. Like, uh, you know, why is it good to do, like, a deficit deadlift? Well, you make that exercise really hard, and you can use less weight, and that beats you up less. And you might get a good training response, but it also helps build your regular deadlift. Right. So that's, 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 making things hard is an interesting thing. Like, do you want to go down super duper duper slow ever if you're looking to perform uh probably not ever but and there's other ways you can make things really super hard that cut down the wear and tear and let you be stronger and more explosive so that's an interesting idea right there we could probably do a whole show on that yeah, yeah. well you know the yeah. uh the, the, what i was gonna say earlier is that even though bodybuilders are, uh, are very strong um the major difference cross fits is they're not functionally strong Mm -hmm. Like your strength per body weight ratio for a CrossFitter, how many pull ups can you see? Have you seen bodybuilders do? They do a lot of lap pull downs, don't they? It's like, how many breaths have I taken today? It's, like, it's <laughs> so routine, it seems doing that shit all the time. Right. You can't they, keep count. Lap pull downs, lap pull downs, lap pull downs. But right. you put a you know 300 pound bodybuilder, and they're not going to be able to do very many pull ups. But you go to CrossFit and you do, you, know, you count the kick, kip ups and all that stuff. I mean, there's reps and reps and reps and reps. So mm -hmm. you're not as functionally strong as a bodybuilder because you're mm -hmm. doing that training that we're talking about. Now, there's no absolutes. There's probably carryover on both. I look at the CrossFit games 
those guys are jacked. Like, they I'm are. Like, these guys could, some of these guys could enter at least a physique competition, yeah. not a body bunch, and win. With the, like, they could literally leave the CrossFit Games, step on stage, and, and you know, win with the physiques they have. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's just they have to be that lean to move that fast, to be that strong, and get all that done. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that, uh, the inefficiency of movement, um, the other thing, well, the thing that could help the most um, – is one thing body building gets right, and I used to, when I, like you said, I have a degree in exercise science. Well, I, I used to actually argue with my teachers, but my professors were all uh, aerobic oriented guys. They were endurance jackasses. Ad- endurance. <laughs> That's what they're also called. It seems but, like most exercise <laughs> physiologists really do kind of swing towards endurance, the yeah, endurance sure. sports. Yes. yes, and it just makes me think, you know, why do they call people like us meatheads? Well, okay, then, well, you know. What does uh, that make you? <laughs> right. Well, let's just say the endurance guys are tend to be the guys with the PhD. You know, there's very few Fred Hatfields out there, Doctor Squatter. You know mm-hmm. those guys. That, but anyway, God bless uh, Andy Galpin. But I would, I would, <laughs> I would literally argue with these guys um, that protein sparing by increasing your carbohydrates doesn't work. Increasing your carbohydrates is not going to make your body use protein more efficiently for muscle now it will keep you from burning muscle of mm-hmm. course but that's just calories period mm-hmm. but the but what i was gonna say is protein intake you know and as long as it's not regular now i'll be honest with you i take about 500 grams of protein every day so that's Whoa, uh, holy shit. yeah hell yeah yeah where do you get that from well uh shakes so what i do is is i'll eat four meals and here's here's the so way for I, all of you who think you're eating a lot <laughs> you ain't shit i'm trying to gain weight but i'm I eat all day. You're not eating 500 grams of protein right. a day. No. Well, yeah, look, if you did, this, you this, might look like Robert. That's right. <laughs> this is fantastic. Tell, tell us about your your day as far as eating goes. Well, here's how it works. Um, I get I have to get to work at 6:30 or 7. You know, and so I get to work. Damn. And I keep I keep. That's so crazy. And what? <laughs> right. <laughs> There's two of those in the day. I thought it was just PM. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they. Uh, but uh, I keep one whole drawer at work in the fridge. Uh, is mine and it's literally stacked with bags of flank steak and chicken breast chunks like the Tyson <laughs> boom, boom. not that yeah. I, I wouldn't eat those if I was getting ready for a Bible show but day to day it's cheap it's quick um, and it's also filled with like butter spray mustard low calorie you know stuff to put on toppings blah 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 um, and then I have about in my if you go and look at my car right now you'll find three cases of RTDs protein RTDs There'll be three cases in the fridge. Ready to go drinks. Ready to drink. Ready to drink, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, there's, There'll be at least three to four cases in the fridge that are out of their cases, just put in there loose. And then um, there's three cases in the car. So I have three, I keep all the time, three cases at work. I try to keep that every month. I just go restock. And so what I do is I get up and I'll awesome. first thing, the first thing I do when I get to work is I'll make myself some breakfast. And generally that tends to be uh, oatmeal. But the way I do it is this. So I don't use so much energy on digestion and I don't get bloated, I'll do 50 to 100 grams of carb at 6.30. Then I'll do uh, 30 to 50 grams of protein um, at 7.30. Then the next hour is a carb hour and then a protein hour. And they over right. Then uh, the meal after... So you're not eating carbs and protein together. You're alternating. Correct. Then the meal... And that's just for me. That's not that I got from anybody. But I noticed that I, my body works more efficiently and I have more energy. Just the the, the when I stuff myself with both if i do 100 grams of carb uh and the protein together um i just get more sluggish you know it's just uh, that insulin release and yeah i get so, that yeah um but now the with the exception of the meal after lunch you know so i'll have lunches whether it be whatever it hit whether it be protein or carb uh and i don't do the system perfectly you know sometimes i mess it up mm-hmm. but the meal before training or after lunch will be uh both together and it, i'll have to deal with a heavy stomach because i'm going to need that energy for training because then you're halfway through a sumo practice and you're sparring and all of a sudden you hit the wall mm. uh, it's not fun hit the wall hard. yeah yeah mm. so uh i think the protein intake you know uh, how, how many years have you been doing the high protein i mean, I'm, I'm, I'm know the answer is probably a long time but the 500 grams um i would say two two years yeah. two years um and that has really made a difference in the composition of my physique, even when I put on, like I was saying earlier, I'm 225 now, uh, July 27th, when the world games are in Colombia, I'll be between 240 and 250. Um, and hopefully that will be 
I'm mostly of increasing muscle mass. Well, how do you do that? Well, then I just up the protein and up the carbs, but I do still do the same thing. I know what all mm-hmm. those aerobic son of a bitch professors are saying right now, listening <laughs> to the show, saying that guy is going to be dead of kidney cancer before you know <laughs> right. it. This right. foolish man, 500 grams of protein. That's what the average American needs in a year. <laughs> but, <right. laughs> but they would say, but you know, pro bodybuilders, they'll eat more than that. You know, uh, and then so what do I do? How, when like I, how much? I'm curious now. Guys, I've seen is, I've seen pros with with, with I, well I've heard reports of uh, you know <laughs> of, 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 uh, reportedly uh, right uh, right uh, you know outside of outside I mean they have to have their muscle mass is so huge mm. uh, and they're burning so many calories and metabolism so fast that they'll do a thousand to two thousand grams of protein. Oh and I'm come do, on! I'm oh, doing the, what? Get, oh, look, this whoa! Is, but here's mm-hmm. I'm doing the math right and I'm going Michael Phelps does thirteen thousand calories. Well, let's divide that by protein, carbon, and fat. And I'm like, how do you get that much in? So I think those are, pre- mm-hmm. but I would say probably seven to 800 is probably what they're really. So basically, doing. every yeah. living moment, these poor sons of bitches are shoving down a chicken breast yes. and a shake and mm-hmm. a chunk of meat and a chicken breast and a shake. I mean, one thing I, I tell people, like, you can, you can have your, your issues with bodybuilding. <laughs> like, I wouldn't do that shit. Fine. Neither would I. <laughs> but you got to acknowledge how fucking disciplined bodybuilders are they oh, throw yeah. everything in their lives on the fucking trash heap mm-hmm. to do this thing and to do it the right way that means there's 800 grams of carbs it means training a lot and by the way like crossfit is hard uh bodybuilding trauma stuff is hard but i wouldn't say so hard i'd say bodybuilding training what they put themselves through is is, is masochistic I mean, they're trying to make themselves hurt as much as possible. They're trying to burn as much as possible. Mm-hmm. They leave. They have another shitty meal. There's their <laughs> sleep patterns, everything. You know, some of these top guys, yeah. I guess, blowing like 50 grand a year or 100 grand a year on drugs. To mm-hmm. I mean, everything you could sacrifice upon the altar to get huge as possible, they're doing. It's like extreme uh, jihadists of the fitness world. They're going <laughs> to fucking do this thing right. no matter what. Well, no I, matter what, you're going to die prematurely. I don't give a shit, son. I'm going to be huge. <laughs> right. And they do it. man. I, you got to give them credit for that. It's oh, hard. Yeah, it's a 24-hour job. So for sure. How many shakes are you drinking a day, and what kind of it, shakes are there? Do you uh, keep it changed up? We, uh, you know, I... Uh, Here's what I here's how I pick my shakes, my RTDs, or my bags of protein mm. is I'll do the uh, I literally take my calculator on my phone when I'm going and looking at all the selection either GNC or Sam's Club or the grocery store wherever I'm at, and I will calculate dollar per gram of protein. Uh-huh. Who has the most for what I'm paying? I will drink it. That's the one I go with. So <laughs> let that be a lesson to all the supplement companies out there. More protein and a lower price. I'm gonna pick your product. So. That's we got, we got to develop a low, I think low cost keyed into that one. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? I think they're probably keyed into that one. Right, right, yeah. The whole business it, is based it, around. Right, right. But, um, so for all the for all the crossfitters that listen to this, that all they heard just now was carb, protein, carb, protein, carb, mm-hmm. protein. And in the CrossFit world, meat, veggies, nuts and seeds, some fruit, little starch, no sugar, protein, veggies, and healthy fats is kind of the way of the world right. in, the, in the paleo world. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe talk about that. Do you do any types of healthy fats intentionally added in? Do you do vegetables? Yeah, well, that's what I was going to tell you. After training or you know after that big meal that i'll have before i train every carb source after training is a vegetable source mm-hmm. with the exception of my post-workout drink which mm-hmm. is 50 sugary carb 50 percent 50 percent sugary carb 50 percent protein mm-hmm. that's that window of 30 minutes and that's something i used from the bodybuilding magic window yeah right that's mm-hmm. i use that for bodybuilding from bodybuilding for everything i do now because mm-hmm. uh, i just get more my body recovers you know um and then after that when i go home uh for the rest of the night Every carbohydrate feeding is going to be preferably leafy greens. If I can get it, you know. Are you still are you still keep alternating protein and carbs at that point? You're eating just vegetables. No, no, just- yeah, that's a good point. I will eat the protein with the because the the greens. I just can't. If I was to fill up on greens, it would be you know. <laughs> so as far as, as far as the uh, right <laughs> as far as the fats go, are you intentionally going out of your way to get fats from maybe nuts, avocados, olive oil, yeah. coconut oil? Do you do any of that? Well, if I'm uh, if I'm doing. Uh, like bodybuilding, yes. But if I'm doing sumo training, I generally get enough nutrition because I can eat anything I like. That I'm going to get some of that stuff in there. Um, and that's so for of, bodybuilding, you want you need calories, but you don't want the carb because you're trying to have a, this this favorable transition and body composition. Correct, correct. And sumo, you're trying to get huge. Exactly. Is that you need to be more powerful? You need to be a bigger, stronger machine. Um, but like when I do a bodybuilding show, I'll take a multivitamin. Mm-hmm. But when I'm off season from bodybuilding, off season, you know, I'm sumo. 
I don't take a multivitamin because I'm getting so many calories mm-hmm. that I know those vitamins are there. The chances of me having a deficiency are pretty slim. Yeah. So that's kind of how I did that. So tip number two was to do, use the workout window that you just mentioned? Well, well it's just up your protein intake. I'm thinking that mm-hmm. if you want to – bigger muscles can't hurt you uh, mm-hmm. if, your, if your body weight stays low for CrossFit. I mean, just judging everything I've seen on TV and seen at your gym, it just seems to me – like a gymnast, body weight, strength for body weight ratio is everything. Well, I tell people all the time, um, you know, when they come to me and, well, how much protein do I need? And most of the time they're getting like half, you know, half of their, uh, half the grams of protein per pound of body weight. You know, they weigh 200 pounds and they're like having a hard time getting 100 grams of protein. Right. And I laugh and I'm like, you need to get at least 200 grams of protein. And they think I'm crazy. Right. So you're eating double your right. your body That's weight. Exactly the so talk. Is there was there like a I know like for me, like as soon as I get around 175 grams of protein, if I don't do that, I'll feel like shit. Right. Um and I did that for like two years. I was getting too little protein. I stopped paying attention what, to it and I woke up and realized it. Were there any benchmarks of protein intake where you noticed big changes? Was it like, you know, oh I used to do body weight and then I went to, you know, body weight and a half for a grams and oh my god it was amazing I mean, well my first bodybuilding show I ever did in, in 1997 um, was the first time I ever logged any of my food so I realized how a little protein I was getting it, that, that realization like you just talked about Chris and so I got up to where I was doing I think right before the show um, like 700 grams of protein and very very little carb <laughs> so but as here's, awesome. the, here's the thing with body composition how it works for me um, the more protein I intake the less appetite I have to feel, I, I can't feel, oh, yeah. you know, I'm feel, I'm full. So am I eating less? I don't want uh, to eat cookies. I don't want to eat junk. Generally, generally, you know, I don't want to do that stuff. You know, when I want sweets or junk food in the middle of the night when my stomach's empty, but when it's full of protein and or whatever else, then I'm, you know, I, I don't want to eat. Yeah, if, if, you, if you yeah. got a belly full of a big chunk of awesome steak, you, you don't really <laughs> less wanting for anything. That's right. That's great advice for a lot of people out there that are trying to, only exclude things that they like from their diet and they're not focusing on eating lots of good healthy food if you right. if you're all full all the time from healthy paleo food then you don't have those cravings for anything else really right, right. well you have room for it there's a i think there's some carryover for that that bodybuilders can use from from crossfit and here's here's the thing is that you know with all that protein powder and like i said i take a pro, rtd and i'll jump i'll dump it in the uh in the uh you know the mixer mm. and then i'll take a scoop of protein powder and put it in into the rtd so like i just did a gave myself a ready double. to drink asterisks <laughs> right <laughs> right so exactly and so um where was i going with that i mean, trying to thought oh but the problem is what's wrong with all those powders and rtd chemicals mm-hmm. there's not not natural things in there it's a bunch of chemicals it's chemically produced mm-hmm. well the difference that i look at the paleo diet is you don't have all that so mm-hmm. the more of those sources bodybuilders can get the better they're going to feel, their energy level is going to be better, I think, if they can get enough calories in. Uh, and then the better they're going to perform in the gym, the more muscle. Yeah, I haven't seen any bodybuilder. Well, I haven't really looked, I'll be honest with you. But I haven't seen anybody who has, <laughs> has taken on the challenge, like doing a paleo-type slant. On like, It's just still you know, uh, grilled chicken breasts and plain veggies and rice on that side of the, mm-hmm. the aisle. I'd like yeah. to see a guy experiment with a – amped up paleo diet to see if he could succeed on a high level in bodybuilding i, I don't know i oh. haven't heard of anybody doing uh, it. a bodybuilder does paleo not not familiar yeah right. yeah that's that's an interesting realization maybe for a i lot will of take on this experiment i'll get should. ripped i'll get shredded and ripped and, and then I'll we're enter, gonna bring in a bodybuilding show robert and i will i won't stay next to robert but we'll enter the same show <laughs> and i'll see how it goes <laughs> yeah yeah we'll see how, I, I eat 700 fucking grams of protein a day we'll see what happens <laughs> I don't think I could do it. 700 grams a day. No, you know, that it's, sounds, it could, it sounds it's insane. Not the, I tell you guys, it's not the diet. It's not the it, how much it takes Like as far as me being full or just, oh, this is too much protein. It's the organization and the timing. And the, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not a very organized person. Like, I, I set my alarm. I set my phone alarm to go part. off an hour, and the alarm will go off and go protein. Then when I take my protein, I'll put the alarm in for an hour from then. Says carb, that'll go off. And now, but I live, I sit at, I live, I, I sit at a desk all day. So I'm food protein. And it's a joke at work. If you go to talk to guys, tell me something about Robert Daniel, and they'll go, dude, he's constantly, eating. <laughs> he's constantly eating. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, what, what are your favorite sources of carbs besides oatmeal? Man, I love potatoes. <laughs> I love okay. them. I love them. Um, 
And uh, I love white. Irish Catholic. And there you go. <laughs> exactly. I love uh, and this is I think from living Hawaii. But if I can get Calrose, not you know they call sticky rice here. It's all kinds of things. But you go to Hawaii or Japan, and the rice they have there is called Calrose rice, and it's that's real sticky rice. Mm-hmm. And it's not sticky because they overcooked it. It's sticky because the glucose in it is greater. There's mm-hmm. a higher sugar content, and it's delicious. So I love, I love white rice. Um, have that in a big plate of Spam. I'm, you're I'm, ready to go. That, there you go. That's exactly. And I'm, I'm not afraid to say I hate brown rice. I just hate it. I will eat it if I have to prepare for something. Um, but uh, preparing for sumo, sky's the limit. If I want a Twix bar, I'll go have it. If that's what I feel like. It's my kind of sport. Man. Right. If my, <laughs> if my weight's within reason. So you know, if you're if trying I, to gain as much weight as possible and there's a Twix bar in front of you, you'll just crush that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if I have the pick between the protein and the Twix and it's, you know, I'm not going to go for the Twix if it's time for my protein feeding. Obviously, there's not enough protein in a candy candy bar. But <laughs> Not by your standards, bro. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, you know, it's funny is I'll look at those like the, the drinks they'll have at Walgreens. They call them protein drinks and about oh, yeah. seven mm-hmm. grams. I'm like, yeah, get right, out of here, right. son. It only take me Get eight garbage four of these out of here. for feeding. <laughs> so five hundred dollars later, I've got my five hundred grams of protein. <laughs> that's right. How much do you spend on groceries? Uh, about eight hundred a month. That's not bad. That's not bad. Well, dude, what are you? Is that, sp- that, for, you is that just for you, or is that yeah, for you and for your fiance? That's just for me. That's just for me. That, so you that, are, you are finding bargains because that actually sounds pretty good. Oh yeah, me. yeah. Well, I go to like I said, I Sam's Club is where I get my protein. But see, this is all I do is I get the protein powders uh, yep. and then the RTDs. I'll get the bags of rice, the 90 seconds. See, everything's already prepackaged. The need to carry Tupperware for bodybuilders to do that anymore is almost gone. You know, the, everything's prepackaged. So I'll get the Uncle Ben's <laughs> prepackaged rice, the little things of prepackaged rice. They have, a, you know, these different brands. You just stick it in the microwave yeah. in the bag or something? Yeah, 45 to 90 seconds. Some of them are 45 seconds, some are, some are 90, and I'll have two or three at a time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jeez. You, you should see me at Kroger. I you just get, to, like, Uncle Ben's white rice? Yeah, yeah, or they have flavors, too, yeah. chicken, and then there's uh, broccoli and cheddar, and then there's all kinds of stuff. That, you I've know. been cooking for myself. <laughs> this is terrible. Right. What 2013? There's no need. I've been shopping at Whole Foods, and I should have been at go, Costco this whole time. If but, you go to to Kroger or Whole Foods, wherever they've got all kinds of shit wrapped in plastic, ready for you to eat. W- wake up, wake up, man! Join true. Modern World. <laughs> all kinds of treats and cookies and all kinds. Of well, shit. you know what's funny though is that if you see me like at a Kroger and I'm getting literally I'll, for the month, I'll buy everything for the month. So I'll take, I'll get 160 of those rice packets at once, <laughs> and these little old ladies will look at me like, "You selfish prick!" <laughs> like, you, I can't believe. And I, and I look. And, wait, <laughs> Excuse you, me, sir. Do you have any more rice in the I'm back? Like, <laughs> these these were these rationed. Were were you planning? Did you did you want to get some of these? And and no, I don't want to. And, but they'll just look at me like I'm being awful. I'm like I'm gonna. Eat all these. I'm not, I'm not Look at me. I'm of course, paying, I'm going to eat it right, all. I'm paying for them, and I'm going to eat them. And unless this is somebody, America. this is America. If, if I can't buy all the rice in a store and eat it all myself, what, 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 why did the Declaration <laughs> of Independence ever get written? I promise you, Kroger wishes they had a thousand guys like me. Come <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, right. no doubt. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, yeah. all right. So, what's one more thing that CrossFitters can learn from bodybuilders? Hi. Um, well, Do we, we talk about how. It's not necessarily a bad thing to train a muscle. Like that's that's sort of a buzzy thing now. Like uh, so, I suppose people would maybe put the bench press sometimes in that, but certain like curls mm-hmm. or maybe like a hamstring curl or I don't know. There's lots of uh, shoulder raises and stuff. I guess you won't see that going on barely ever in a in a CrossFit box. I will mm-hmm. say this though. Like uh, I don't know if you know uh, Jennifer Robinson. She's a physique pro here mm-hmm. in Memphis. Uh, and every once in a while, I'll train with her. Mm-hmm. And just like other pros, if you watch YouTube videos, they're so damn creative. Or they've already learned from the, I mean, but they, the exercises they come up with, like she tries to kill me, you know, not even meaning to, but her exercises mm-hmm. are so inefficient and tough. So if you're doing <laughs> uh, anything that requires explosion from your lower body, you know, working your hamstrings is never going to be a bad thing. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, no, you could overwork it, absolutely. But uh, just those uh, ancillary exercises that you yep. do for these major performance moves. Are going to help you. Yeah. So the, these exercises, like you could, you can even call it glute ham raise. Basically, just a glorified fucking hamstring curl, uh, barbell curls, mm-hmm. uh, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I've you know, definitely there's, done there's, glute ham raise for the hamstring. That's yeah, there's like, not, a there's curl. not a really impressive yeah. lifter I can name mm-hmm. who has who doesn't do at least some things that aren't with a barbell and don't have direct carryover to competitive lifts. Like even really really excellent weightlifters who. 90% of the time, they're going to do the lifts, and their assistance work is squatting. Mm-hmm. That's what they do, and that's what, that's what makes them great. But they do 
you'll see a guy do uh, an ex- like the the Chinese team doing you know, terminal knee extensions or hamstring curls or maybe you could even get a little close to other let's say you know d- barbell rows and or dumbbell rows and things that a lot of people say look you don't need to do that don't waste your time but successful people do it and get benefit from it so you know yeah building the ability for one part of your body to work more seems to have it's hard to measure hard to really get your head around but it seems to have a carryover to the lifts that utilize that part of the body but then you, you you're lifting better like a hamstring curl has always or a glue ham raise with a little bit of bandage has always helped me deadlift better can't tell you why but i always feel immediately faster when i do that exercise mm-hmm. maybe let's turn that around uh, instead of instead of talking about how bodybuilding uh can help or what crossfitters can learn from bodybuilders where do you guys think crossfitters have it on 100 spot on right and we should not be training like bodybuilders can i can I tell you one thing yeah Go for it freaking pull-ups man <laughs> That's the best back exercise ever that bodybuilders could get from CrossFit. If that's what kind of you're saying, is that what you're asking me? Or, um, or, or we, how? We, we can touch on that. Okay. Yeah, well, ahead, just the, that the fact that the fact that pull-ups to get good at them, you have to do so many reps. And but when you first start, especially if you're a bodybuilder, you're 250 pounds mm. and you haven't been doing, them, you're going to do one rep that's good, and that's it. If and that, then you have to wait for 30 seconds to a minute, and then do one rep. So it takes mm-hmm. patience. And, but the level of strength gain, and therefore the level of mass gain, time under contraction is. Super. Remember? Yeah, I, I used to do a lot of pull downs of all kinds. I, p- I power lifted. And yeah, it's it's good, but you can get to where you can do a pull down with like the whole stack for like twenty reps, and you can still maybe not even do five decent pull ups. To me, it's like there's zero. It's like bench pressing. You can bench press all you want, mm-hmm. but it has zero carryover to like a standing strict press. If you bench mm-hmm. press five hundred pounds, I don't care. Let me see you do a strict press. You may do one eighty five. I don't know. There's no there's no correlation really. But if you get to where you can press twice your body weight or something overhead, you're going to bench press just fine. So think if, you, if you're a guy who can do 45, 50 pull-ups with no problem, you got no problem when you get on a pull-up machine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're going to be All just right. fine. And your back spark going to be V-tapered like a son of a bitch. Yeah, man. Like those top CrossFitters have physiques that feature a pretty damn good set of, of back muscles, if you ask me. Mm-hmm. It's probably from the yeah, concept actually, too, rover. On, on that note, yeah, I, think exactly. actually, I actually think CrossFitters could do more strict pull-ups as well. CrossFitters do a lot of kipping pull-ups, mm. and occasionally they do weighted pull-ups, but I think they could do more just straight-up dead-hang body weight pull-ups on the rings and on the bar. Well, Our, you think it would make your kipping pull-ups feel so much easier. Like, yeah. You think it would have a mental benefit to that. Following mm. last year's regionals, I had the whole team for a month. You know, they, It was like no kipping for mm. a month just, gotcha. to, just to save the shoulders. Well, if it, it makes y'all feel any better, my kipping pull up is way worse than my regular pull up. I, I want to see it. <laughs> well, just we, after we need to I watch see videos, it. and I go, okay, I could do, you know. And I told you, it's I said, hard, one of these man. days, you know, I like to do the powerlifting, the Olympic lifting, the strongman. And I said, okay, I'm gonna throw in some CrossFit in there. I'm Jesus. gonna do these faction games once a year, blah. blah. And so I go over there, and I, I, and so I'm in uh, in the gym, and I'm doing a, trying to do a kipping pull up, and I'm opening up my shoulders and trying to close and kip up, and I'm like. I look like an idiot. <laughs> it, take, it takes some practice, man. So, yeah. yeah if you get, if you get, somebody uh, discovered CrossFit again, <laughs> that jackass in the corner. Right. You need to set out a year and do that. So, you do CrossFit, strongman, power thing, weightlifting, sumo, and then maybe maybe you can get crazy, like try to throw in like judo and a couple other things there. Just see. <laughs> you can maybe set a record for doing the most we'll, crazy we'll, shit in a year. We'll make a, an artsy fartsy video about it. Right. Yeah. Well, or one of those. Robert uh, Daniel. The Arnold. What is it? The, the Arnold. ultimate stro- shrink <laughs> conditioning. <laughs> Yeah, you go, you go to the Arnold and compete in everything in the Arnold. I think it'd be more like Robert Daniel, the most injured. <laughs> the guy who sucks at the most stuff. <laughs> right. Very mediocre Finished at Finished last in every meet. Jack of all trades is a Robert Daniel story. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, great. Let's uh, go ahead and wrap this up. Doug, I'm going to let you go with your plug first. Uh, since this is kind of a time-sensitive thing right now, we have Justin Thacker's weightlifting seminar coming up here in, uh, we're looking at two or three weeks, so... Uh, if you want to come to that, you got to jump on that right away. Again, go to uh, barbellshrug.com, click on the shop, click on seminars, and then it's um, a weightlifting seminar with Justin Thacker. Um, uh, what? How much? Seven ninety-seven. Seven ninety-seven for that two-day event. Uh, again, that is a um, not necessarily a seminar. It's really a live recording. So the intention is for us to make a weightlifting product. So as part of that event. Uh, you might be on camera, and you're going to be getting a lot of one-on-one attention um, from Justin on that two-day seminar. So if you want to be a part of that, um, again, go sign up as soon as possible because that event is coming up here in the next two or three weeks. All right. Anything you want to promote? 
Memphis, uh, Memphis no, BJJ, maybe? No, if anybody's interested in trying sumo, uh, just give us a call at Memphis Judo and Jiu-Jitsu, and, and Dave Ferguson, the owner over there, can put you in touch with me. You know, there's a lot of people say they are, but hey, if they show up maybe <laughs> once or twice, you know, come give it a shot. If I get rid of my belly, I may put that if you, thing on. If, <laughs> if you did, particularly if anybody out there did any wrestling and football, those are the perfect people. They did both high school wrestling and high school football. They want to do something now. Bingo. They should sumo. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, maybe if people are bored this weekend, they come by. If they're in the Memphis area, come by to your wedding. <laughs> Say hello. <laughs> right. <laughs> Add them onto the 375. Uh, they they're going to be there. So yeah. Oh, exactly. Man. Yeah. How many shrimp cocktails you got to order for this thing? I, <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, but uh, it's, a, it's a big wedding. Congratulations yeah. again, man. That's yeah, awesome. Thank you. What shall I plug? I don't know, man. Follow, how about this? Follow, follow me on the Twitter. My handle. Is that what it's called? Your name on Twitter? I think the so. Twitter handle? <laughs> yeah. At Chris Moore XL. Shoot me a, a message. We'll talk. We'll, in 140 characters at a time, we'll regale each other with all kinds of stories about training and life and philosophy and whatever else you can think of. And uh, cruise on by the Chris Moore blog dot com. The Chris Moore blog dot com. The only Chris Moore blog dot com blog on Google. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, make sure to follow me on Twitter as well, at Michael Bledsoe. Do not follow CTP. We're having a competition right now. Do not. And get the most followers. So follow me, not CTP underscore faction. What if we're both if, already following you? <laughs> Who should we drop? Who should we unfollow? Tell, tell us your rationale right now. So what? Who should we unfollow for following both of you? Because you can also lose and win. If, whoever loses the most will lose in us. Like if, if you lose 100 followers, you have the advantage. Why would I lose followers? I'm saying, convince people to, to defollow him or unfollow oh, him yeah, and follow yeah. Everyone you. stop uh, following CTP. Net followers is what you're just net, Yeah, net followers. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Make sure to go to barbellshrug.com, put your name in for the newsletter, and so you can get updated on all the cool stuff we're doing. we got a lot of stuff coming up. So um, if you don't want to miss it and you're not able to watch every single show and hear about what's happening, uh, sign up for that. Plus, we get very forgetful on the show, but we're pretty good at the email. Later, or, you know, just, just ignore everything we told you and hurt our feelings, why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> see if we care. We're going to cry ourselves to sleep tonight. That's all right. Thanks for coming on the show, Robert. Hey, thank you, guys. <laughs>